Brothers and sisters, welcome once again to the well, to this place of encounter with the Jesus who gives us living water to satisfy our thirst forever. It is Maundy Thursday, and we're going to begin our service by listening to a reading from John's Gospel. Today's Gospel is from the 13th chapter of John. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Here ends the gospel reading. 
I don't know about you, but the deeper we get into Holy Week, the more I'm missing being with you in the, in the flesh. The more I long for that day when we'll be able to gather together and give thanks and praise to God for all that God has done for us. But those days are still a way off. You know, there's a lot of talk uh, these days about why average Sunday attendance is going down in the Episcopal Church, the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, I mean, just about every church. And everybody has their theory. Um, if you were at a gathering of people talking about this subject, you might hear someone say, well, you know, the, the worship just needs to have better music. The preaching needs to be more, more relevant, more engaging. You know, we need to find new ways to express ourselves. And of course, all of these reasons have some bearing on what is going on, to be sure. But let's be clear, the fundamental issue is none of that stuff. The fundamental issue is that there is deep down inside of us a resistance to being loved by God. Being loved by God absolutely unconditionally. And therefore the thought of being in a worship service for an hour and just sitting there is almost unimaginable for many. You see, the dominant religion of our society is not Christianity. Let me repeat, it's not Christianity. You've heard me say this before. The dominant religion of our society is the market-driven consumer society, which day in and day out gives us its statutes and ordinances, its commandments, its rituals, all of which lead us to believe that we are not enough and that unless we produce, 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 unless we are highly accomplished, that we simply do not matter. And when you have been marinated in that 24 hours a day, the thought of worshiping, the thought of just sitting in a church and letting something happen to you is almost too much to bear. Well, each day of Holy Week is about God's assault on that resistance. Day after day, what we are being invited to do is to open up to a love that is beyond what we ever dreamed. But there is a deep resistance and today's story from the Gospel of John gives us a paradigmatic example of this. Peter. So Jesus gets up from table and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. What the heck is he doing? And when he gets to Peter, Peter will have none of this. Peter says, you will never wash my feet. I should be washing your feet. And then Jesus says, words that should give us great pause. Unless you let me wash you, Peter, you will have no part in me. You will have no share in me. Unless you let me lavish you with my love, you will have no connection with me. You will have no idea what I am up to. On this Monday, Thursday, Jesus is attacking our resistance. Do you want to be connected to me, Peter? 
And if you want to be connected to me, you've got to let me love you. We all resist this. About 25 years ago, my wife was ordained. And five years ago, on the 20th anniversary of our ordination, she wanted to celebrate the Eucharist at the Church of the Redeemer where she then worked and do it at one of their Wednesday night services. So I said I would come and be with her and the other handful of folks that were there. But then I had a brilliant idea. So every so often I have a brilliant idea. And I thought what I would do is I would invite people from St. Timothy's who were at her ordination. And I wouldn't tell her about this. They'd just, they'd just show up. And so just before the service began, the first couple walked in. And Nancy was surprised and delighted. And I think she just assumed that they had come to an evening service at Redeemer. Well, as the others started arriving, she began to figure out what was going on and she was smiling and she was happy. And when the service started, uh, she said, oh, this is so much fun. But when she got to the sermon part of the service, I got up and preempted her. And all I did was I said to her that we were all here tonight because we wanted to thank God for her. We wanted to let her know how much we love her and how grateful we are for all that she has done for us. And as I began to expect to uh, express our collective gratitude and love, you could just see her growing increasingly uneasy. And finally, I said, is there anything anybody else wants to say? At which point she said, no, you've said quite enough. And made me sit down. You know, and that kind of love is washing over you. You find yourself to acting like, Peter, you will never wash my feet. No, you will never show me that much love. You know, what is revealed tonight is that the fundamental issue for all of us is will we let ourselves be loved absolutely, unconditionally, without reservation by God? Before Nancy and I ever came to Cincinnati, we were part of a group in Boston, uh, a group of people who help people learn how to pray. And we were on a retreat with the other people in this group, about 20 of us. And the leader of this group was the, the superior of the Society of St. John the Evangelist, a monastic order. And he was stepping down from his role in this group. And the leader of our retreat at one point put a chair in the middle of a circle of chairs and put the leader of our group, Tom Shaw, in that chair in the center and then had the rest of us sit in the chairs surrounding him. And our job was to share a few words with him. Well, of course, what people did is they shared their gratitude and their love and affection with him. And I'll never forget how willing he at least seemed to be. Maybe he was burning up inside, but how willing he at least seemed to be to just take that in. Well, on this Monday, Thursday, will we let Jesus wash us and will we take it in? You know, I would guess that every Maundy Thursday that I've ever been a part of, less than half of the people come forward to have their feet washed. 
And I would guess that if you ask some, you know, why don't you come forward? I don't ask them why. They're not required to come forward. But I guess if I asked them why, someone would say, oh, you know, I'm just a little uncomfortable having someone look at my feet. That may be true, but I think underlying that is a resistance to being so loved. Allowing another human being to be God's hands, washing you, loving you, caring for you, and therefore they just don't come forward. You know, we all have a resistance to this. We find it when somebody thanks us and says, oh, I thank you so much for what you did for me the other day. And we say, oh, oh don't, don't, don't worry about it. It's okay. You know, rather than just saying, oh, you're welcome, just letting it in. That kind of love is, is a threat to us. It makes us uncomfortable. But it's the key to everything. And it's certainly the key to what we're able to then give away to others. You know, the dynamic of the gospel is that we can't give what we have not received. When we gather around the Lord's table and receive the bread and wine, we can't give what we have not received. So we take this bread and wine in us and it then allows us to give that bread and wine away. And of course, unless we let Jesus wash our feet, we will not be able to wash others. You may have noticed on occasion in someone else or in yourself that when someone is busy helping others, sometimes it just doesn't feel right. Sometimes there's an anxiety to their helping. It just feels driven. Well, what you can probably assume is that that person is helping and loving out of a place that is not coming from them having been loved. For our love to be given away freely and abundantly, we first have to take it in. Let Jesus wash your feet tonight. Let him love you. It is a thing you and I need the most. Amen.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we do every year, we meditate today on the passion of our brother Jesus. We witness his acts and lessons of love, his sharing his body and blood with these beloved followers, his friends betraying him, his anguish alone in the garden, his resolve to do his Father's will. His story stays the same, but not ours. This year is like no other, for we too are suffering. We who considered our world a safe place now see hundreds of thousands ill from everyday acts like grocery shopping or being together with friends or family. People die alone with no one to comfort or grieve with them. We see body bags stacked in large trucks with nowhere to go. Healthcare workers cry from fatigue and despair, worrying about infecting their families at home. People who had long assumed their hard work would support their loved ones witness their jobs disappearing with no relief at hand and businesses in which they had invested years now deflating from sight. We also see that this cup will not soon pass from our lips. And yet we must confess that our collective failings are so obvious. We don't have money changers in our temples as Jesus' time did. But we have people making money from hoarding and reselling crucial supplies. We have untold billions in assets as a nation, but our frontline workers die from a shortage of simple masks. The poorest of the poor are dying by the second, while we worry about our own toilet paper supply. Our boredom drives us to risk socializing rather than staying apart. And those caring for the sick and dying have no time to rest. Our leaders argue about whose decisions are responsible for this crisis. And the wise ones measure their words carefully so they won't be silenced. Forgive us, Lord for we are sinners in your sight. Thank you for not giving up on us in our foolishness. And yet, O oh Lord, each holy week we remember that selfishness and greed and fear and death never have the last word with you. As we pray in our own garden of Gethsemane, 
remind us that we are never alone in our grief and anxiety, for you are going with us to lead the way to new life. Grant us patience to allow new life to blossom in due time. Open our hearts to the beauty in the world around us. Give us wisdom to hear truth and courage to turn truth into action. Enable us to channel your transformative love where it is most needed. And finally, dear father and mother of us all, when we are once again able to worship you together, help us raise our voices to you in hallelujahs of gratitude and joy. In the name of Jesus, our brother and redeemer, amen.